Good morning. Everybody hear me in the back? Sorry. When Ken was going on vacation, he asked for preachers, and so I said, hey, I'll do a Sunday. And on his last Sunday for vacation, he said, I have a really good list of preachers lined up for you. And so the first thing I did is go back and make sure I was still on that list. Um, but I was, so you'll just have to deal with whatever comes this morning. I've been teaching through Exodus in, in Sunday school, as some of you know, so this might be a little bit of a repeat for some of you, but that stuff should never really get old. And for those of you who are not in the Exodus Sunday school class, nobody's perfect, that's on you. So <laughs> let's pray this morning and then we'll get started. Now, Father, we come to you humbly and we just thank you for the morning, the beautiful morning, cooler weather, the gift of life that you've given us, all the things that we have that we don't even think about. To so, Father, it's my prayer this morning that you would put in our hearts to be grateful, to have a gratitude for who you are and what you've done. It's my prayer that no one would walk out of here today without knowing who you are. You've given us your word, Father, so we might know you. So I pray that we're attentive this morning, that my, my mind would be cleared of all the distractions from the outside world, that you would keep me from error, that those listening either here or at home streaming would be edified, that their hearts would be open. Thank you. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So you can go ahead and open up to Exodus 10. We'll kind of be all over the place this morning, but that's the main text. We'll start it this way. <clears throat> In the beginning, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now what God has brought together, let no man separate, and I would say that what God has separated let no man bring together. Light and darkness cannot mix. And yet we know that after the fall, darkness, a deep darkness, a spiritual darkness crept into the world and it brought death. Like a plague covering the land of the whole world, sin begat sin. And the disobedience of one couple, Adam and Eve, grew into full-blown rebellion by all of mankind. And then we read a few short chapters later, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his heart was evil only continually. And so that rebellion that was both heavenly and earthly was swept away by the flood. But still, mankind, after their first parents, through Noah's son Ham, would continue to rebel until once again all the nations march against God's authority, his goodness, his justice, and the world once more had been shadowed under spiritual darkness. There came a point where the nations were then divided up, and yet one, who was not in existence yet, but one of them would come, which was to act like a light to all the other nations. God chose a man named Abram. And he changed his name to Abraham. And he told him that a people would come from him. And they did. And God also said this. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But, he said, I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. 
And so God told them, he told Abraham what was going to happen, both that they would be afflicted and that he would bring judgment and deliver them. And over time they forgot, as one tends to do after 400 years. And so that then brings us to the book of Exodus. And this people, God's people, the Hebrews, had indeed suffered and been afflicted for 400 years in a land called Egypt. But lest we think that it was just a series of unfortunate events, thank you, Lemony Snicket, we must remember that it was God, Yahweh, that put them there. And why? Why would God do that? So he would make known not just to his people, and not just to the Egyptians, but to the entire world, his name. That the world would know who he is. His glory. And in fact, this is exactly what Yahweh tells Pharaoh through Moses. He says, but for this purpose, everything that was going on, for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be reclaimed in all the earth. Pharaoh's time was up. 400 years had come and gone. And the Hebrews groaned and they cried out and they moaned to be delivered. And no matter what Pharaoh did, he couldn't stop it. He was afraid of the growing slave population that maybe one day they would rise up and fight against him. And so he tried to control it. First, by ordering that babies would be murdered immediately after birth, quietly, secretly, silently. Do we not have that happening today? And when that didn't work, in fact, the population grew. He had another idea. Let's throw all the male infants and the small children into the Nile, where the Egyptian gods could do as they pleased if they accepted that horrible sacrifice. But now it was time. God was about to rescue his people. And of course, Pharaoh didn't like this idea when Moses said, Yahweh says, let my people go. The slaves were a really good workforce, cheap, used to build all the vain and self-serving projects of Ramses II, who I think is the Pharaoh at the time. So he didn't want him to go. And so through Moses, Yahweh demanded that Pharaoh let his people go. And at every turn, Pharaoh wouldn't do it. And it sets up the showdown that dominates the first force of that book. But mankind's rebellion was spurred on by evil. This just wasn't mankind's sin. This was an evil thing that was going on in Egypt, far above humanity. See, Exodus wasn't just about God rescuing a people, although it is that, or performing miracles for Moses, which it is that too. It was a war. That's what Exodus is. Between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. And I know that sounds strange, but that's exactly what God himself tells us it was. He says in Exodus 12, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. So multi-purposed. And all the signs and the plagues were aimed at the deliverance of God's people and they were aimed at the gods of Egypt to demonstrate that Yahweh was dominant over them and they had no power. Now all the nations had their gods and this is what began to terrify them as news of what God was doing for his own people spread because they were finding out that Yahweh wasn't just a territorial Elohim, a territorial God. This God wasn't restricted by borders or matched in power or servient or subservient to anybody else. In fact, what was going on in Egypt was demonic. And Yahweh was going to leave Egypt desolate, destroyed, and demoralized. And the war wasn't just for his people, but for his glory, so that my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. So I want to make any mistake about this, that this history was a demonstration of the greatness of Yahweh in cosmological proportions, which means everywhere. But the more that took place as God starts to interact 
the harder Pharaoh's heart grew. He started with mocking the God of the Hebrews. Who is Yahweh? Who is this little God of the slaves that I shall obey his voice and let these people go? I do not know who Yahweh is. He had heard of Yahweh, but he's not recognizing his power. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. In fact, he was daring Yahweh, go ahead, do what you will. Now, Pharaoh had set himself up as a god. That's how he was recognized. And he wasn't about to bow down to a god of slaves. But God was about to give Pharaoh a how do you do that no one would ever forget. Oh, you don't know who I am? Well, allow me to introduce myself. And he did. Sign after sign, plague after plague, he demonstrated his power and he executed judgment on the Egyptian gods. The Nile, the sustaining element of life in Egypt, was turned into blood. Yet even after this, we read, Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen. Then the Lord sent frogs that covered the land until Pharaoh asked Moses to plead with Yahweh to take them away. But even after he did, we read, and Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Yahweh sent gnats from the dust of the earth that covered the land, And again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen. Great swarms of flies were sent upon the Egyptians. And yet, you guessed it. Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. So sign after sign, plague after plague, Egyptian God after Egyptian God, being embarrassed and still, Pharaoh said, no go. He would not relent. Next came the death of the livestock as Yahweh escalated the war. And again, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. How idiotic does one person have to be? How about painful boils? Surely that would cause Pharaoh to turn when he's itching and in pain. But no, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then the Lord starts in on the decimation of the land, and he sends hail, the likes of which had never been seen. And so many people want to make all of these miracles about supernatural, or I'm sorry, natural elements. It was just a sandstorm. It was just this. It was just that. It wasn't unusual. Then I ask them, why were they so terrified? This was supernatural. So he starts the decimation of the land, and he sends this hail, and we read this. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. They had never seen anything like this. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. People were starting to die. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Now Pharaoh was responsible for what this this concept called ma'at, the Egyptians believed in. This idea of balance and peace, order. Slaves were slaves, they remained slaves. The sun rose every day. As long as everybody was in their place and everything was fine, then he was maintaining ma'at, order. And so after the hail, when he sees what's going on, there's a momentary spot of weakness that we read about Pharaoh. And you think that maybe now's the time he's going to repent. But again, once the hail stopped, we read this. He sinned yet again and hardened his heart. He and his servants. Now the rebellion is growing. And so the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. He then finishes off the land by sending locusts that everything that was left from the field in the hail, from the hail, nothing remained of it. And at this point, Pharaoh's servants even started to see what's going on and they pleaded with them, Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? Let them go. What are you doing? But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go. And so this battle between good and evil, Yahweh and the gods of Egypt escalated. Cosmological spiritual warfare was being waged. It wasn't just a bunch of Sunday school stories to tell children. And that brings us to the ninth plague in Exodus 10. Verse 21 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, 
a darkness to be felt. And I believe this darkness demonstrates three things to us. The first is the darkness of sin. It was a darkness to be felt. It's not that they just couldn't see, they could feel it. Now some who wish to explain this, the supernatural way, like I mentioned before, they, they claim it was just a gigantic sandstorm. That's what they were feeling, is just the sand. And they were so big and powerful that it would have blot out the sun for a period of time. But there was still light. And if this is all that it was, then they wouldn't have been scared. They would have been used to it. Maybe it was worse than usual, but not uncommon. The calm scene, they're called. We've seen this before. But that's not what it was. This was no mere sandstorm. It was a darkness that could be felt. And they were as blind spiritually as they were physically. Proverbs 4. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Nexus tells us that's exactly what happened. It was a darkness to be felt. It states, so Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise up from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. That's quite the sandstorm that can mark territory borders, isn't it? The darkness paralyzed them. That's what sin does. And one commentator, I'm going to read this whole thing to you because it adequately explains some of the problems they would have encountered. He says, to appreciate fully this plague account, one must understand how evil darkness threatened ancient people. We travel easily at night with the aid of various forms of electric lighting. They were virtually immobilized by the darkness of nighttime unless the night was cloudless and the moon was relatively full. Although some ancient professional caravaners could travel partly at night, they were able to do so mainly at times other than the dark of the moon, but only because their animals could see better than they could, and especially because they travel on well-defined, well-remembered paths. Straying from those paths in darkness could be fatal. We can be active at night because our homes and places of work can be cheaply illumined. Well, maybe not so cheaply anymore. They closed up their cities at night. They barred their courtyard gates and they locked their house doors. People who were abroad in nighttime were assumed to be criminals, and typically, in fact, they were. Now, we feel relatively safe during the night, even away from home, with various means of communication to call for help readily available. Cell phones, we just carry them with us all the time. They were at the mercy of common thieves and bandits when away from home at night, and unless well-armed and in large groups, they were easy prey for those who used the nighttime as cover for evil. That's when bad things happened. They understood that the darkness was essentially chaotic, a kind of enemy to the safe and the good. We may think of it as just another phase of the day. They considered confinement and darkness a grave punishment from God, even a sort of sometimes purposeful force, and associated it with death. Well, we don't think much about it at all. It wasn't the same then as it is now. So for them to have a total, sudden blackout, as the verse says, pitch blackness, which in Hebrew means the darkness of darkness, the dark darkness, pitch darkness, penetrating darkness, they would have been alerted to the fact that something was very, very wrong. And that's how sin works. It's a darkness that is felt. It's not natural. In fact, in the Hebrew, the phrase to be felt could also be translated as a darkness to be felt about or groping about a darkness that would cause them to have to feel their way even around their own homes in blindness. They didn't see each other. They couldn't leave their houses. There was no light in their houses. There were no sense of time. You wake up and the sun's supposed to be up and it's not, and pretty soon you lose track of time, and it causes mental problems. No sense of direction. Nobody rose from their place because they could not know where they were going. What a terrifying thing if you're an Egyptian. It's terrifying not to know where you're going. My wife told me once that I had no sense of direction. And I said, where did that come from? 
But that's exactly what spiritual darkness is like. You don't know where you're going. You couldn't see anybody. And as terrified as they were, as they were after three days, here's the scary part, they might have started to grow accustomed to it. John states, in fact, that people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The Egyptians were blind spiritually to the things of Yahweh. They had worshipped created things, cows and the Nile and the sun and birds and bugs and the dirt. They worshipped these things instead of the true creator. And God had called Pharaoh to repent, to let his people go, but he didn't. Even in the midst of darkness, he and his people continued on in their rebellion. It's like what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. The God of this world had blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And here God gave them physical darkness to match their spiritual darkness. Now, the second thing to note about this darkness is this. In the context of their culture, very specifically, this plague was, us, was a sign. It was very personal to the Egyptians and especially to Pharaoh himself. Now, as you know, they had a plethora of deities, of gods, of Elohim that they worshiped, everything you can imagine. And as mentioned, one of the things that God was doing with these plagues as he brought judgment to them was executing judgment on those gods. But among all of them was their chief deity, the sun god, Ra, who at this point in their history most likely was probably syncretized with another god called Amun. That's where we get the whole Amun-Ra from. And so you either hear Ra or Amun-Ra. And Ra was the sustainer of life. And Pharaoh was declared the son of Ra. Again, he was the sun god. He was the solar deity. And as one book, one book put it, Ra was a universal deity who acted within the heavens, the earth, and in the underworld. In addition, the god was a prime element in most Egyptian creation myths and also acted as a divine father and protector of the king. So Ra was a big deal. He supposedly ruled the heavens and the sun disk that they saw every day was considered to be his visible body. He, quote, daily navigated the great celestial ocean in his day bark or his boat which crossed the sky from sunrise to sunset every day. In fact, in the Book of the Dead, for example, it states, I am he, Ra, who crosses the sky. I am the lion of Ra. Think they're stealing from a worldview much? In fact, the constellation Leo then becomes associated with Pharaoh, and hence the great sphinx. You know what the great sphinx is? That's why it was built. He regulated, he gave, and he protected life in Egypt as he made his journey across the sky. And through his son, the Pharaoh, like we talked about, this concept of Ma'at was given, order, balance, right, wrong. And in one hymn to him, one, ad, one of adulation has written this, Ra has placed the king on the earth of the living forever and eternity in order to judge mankind, to satisfy the gods, to make right happen and to annihilate wrong such that he gives divine offerings to the gods, funerary offerings to the blessed dead. The name of the king is in the sky like that of Ra. He lives in joy like Ra Horakati. Nobles rejoice when they see him. The populace gives him praise in his role of the child, the one, the son. This was a direct, evil, rebellious affront to the true God and his son, wasn't it? And so they believed that he made this journey every day and every day the sun came up and it gave them hope that Ra was in fact still ruling over the two lands of Egypt, upper and lower, and that Pharaoh was doing his job and life continued on as normal. But what happened at night? What about when the sun went down below the horizon? Then what? Well, they believed another journey took place that represented death, that Ra would sink into the sunset and he would have to make this underworld journey and travel through and make it through so the next morning he would come again to the netherworld, the underworld. He would have to pass through the darkness to be basically reborn the next morning. That's what they thought the sunrise was. And the Egyptian would know that all was well when they saw that golden disc peek up over the horizon. But the nighttime scared them because Ra was absent. 
Why? Because the journey for Ra, some God he is, was dangerous for him. He had to have other gods help him on this journey. I tell you all this for a reason. He had to have other gods help him on his boat across this underworld. And why? Because there was this monster sermon that they believed in called Apep, or more commonly Apophis, which by the way, learn this, there's a near-earth asteroid named after this god, god of chaos. And he would have to fight this monster serpent every night and kill it every night as it tried to impede Ra's journey and swallow him up. And so Apophis represented evil to them, chaos. He was an enemy of Ra, and Ra would need the help of other deities if he was gonna make this journey and live to tell the tale. And so can you imagine knowing this Growing up with this, this is what you worshiped. This was your religion, being Pharaoh and having this happen, that sudden darkness like this for three days. You imagine how terrifying it would be for you to be as an Egyptian at that moment in history. The other confusion about what would have ensued, like where is Ra? No sun, what happened? Whether they woke up in the morning and that golden disc didn't show up, or whether it started in the midday when the heat was warming the land and it suddenly was just blotted out, pitch black, their entire life, their entire religion came to a grinding halt. As we read, no one rose from their places. There was nothing they could do. No one saw another. Ra was helpless because Yahweh used him as a toy. Their religion was turning out to be a sham. Yahweh was executing judgment. They knew something wasn't right. In fact, interestingly, as with pretty much all ancient Near Eastern cultures, the Egyptians built their temples with the entrance to the east so that when the sun rose, when Ra was reborn, the light would enter the temple through the door and then through a series of reflections would light up the temple so the priests could, do the, could go do their work. But with no sun, it meant that the cult of Ra was closed. Not open for business today, Yahweh rules. Yahweh was toying with them. Now, lots of people are afraid of the dark. I was teaching the youth last Sunday night, and I asked them, what are you afraid of? Spiders, death. Uh, One girl said um, the dark, and I initially thought she said dorks. And I was like, I... (laughs) I didn't do anything to offend you. What's the problem? But it was the dark. And lots of people are afraid of the dark, not because they think something lurks there, but because they don't know what's in there. They don't know what it hides. And the Egyptians are probably thinking, had Apophis won? Did Ra get swallowed up? Is this God of the Hebrews? Does he have something to do with this? Remember, this wasn't announced to them. This just happened. And what about Pharaoh? Where's Pharaoh? How could he have let this happen? Isn't he supposed to maintain order? Does he have no power either? And so you think about what had happened to Egypt up to this point, and Pharaoh was responsible for that ma'at, that balance. And now everything was out of order. Chaos had been let loose. So apparently Pharaoh wasn't doing his job. And Ra, along with all the Egyptian gods, couldn't do a thing about it. In fact, it was the exact opposite of Maat. Egypt was being systematically destroyed. In fact, many commentators said this, something along the lines of this, that in short, the plagues were a kind of decreation. Yahweh created everything, he can decreate everything. He makes the sun to rise, he can, he can stop it from rising. He created the animals, the animals died. He created the bugs, and the bugs were turned against them. Everything was going upside down in Egypt. And so they were terrified because what were they going to do? Nothing. Nothing they could do. And finally, this plague was so terrifying because of what it pointed to. So you cannot divorce the ninth plague from the tenth plague. There's a reason that God did them in this order. And what it pointed to was death. The plague of darkness served as a precursor to what was coming next. And the darkness at this point almost had Pharaoh relenting. And we read in verse 24, 
once he knows that he's in trouble. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, go, serve Yahweh. Your little ones may also go with you, but only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Our livestock also must go with us, not a hoof should be left behind. If we go, all of it's gone. For we must take them of them to serve the Lord our God, and we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. And Pharaoh knew he was cunning, stupid, but cunning, that they wouldn't survive without their livestock. If they could keep the livestock in Egypt, the Hebrews would have to come back. And so you think about what had happened here so far. Pharaoh's land was devastated. He knew that if the livestock went with Moses and the people, then that entire workforce is gone for good. How are they going to rebuild everything that had been destroyed? His slave labor was gone. His pride was destroyed. And so even after all of that, from the land being decimated, his chief deity eclipsed, we read this, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, you can almost see this in your mind. Pharaoh says to Moses, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. Oh, the irony in the pitch blackness. And he has the nerve to tell Moses, never see my face again. And Moses is like, you're not seeing anybody's face ever. And then he threatens him. Pharaoh tells Moses, for on the day you see my face, you will die. But we know the story. Moses isn't the one that died. And see, darkness was always associated with judgment. That's just, I think, something that God put into mankind to know. That's why people are afraid of the dark. That's why people don't like the dark, because they understand that something is wrong. It's always used as a precursor or a form of judgment. So listen to all these passages, for example. In Joel, he writes, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Greg talked about that last week. It is near. And what does he call it? He calls it this, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, that pitch black darkness. It's coming. Isaiah, they will growl over it on that day like the growling of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and distress, and the light is darkened by clouds. And again, he says, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen by you. And nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Jeremiah, before they were exiled, he's talking to them, they were threatened. This is what God said to them. Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness. Do you see the threat? Before he brings darkness, you better worship him. Before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains, while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and he makes it deep darkness. It was judgment. Amos connects this to Egypt as well. He says, shall not, shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all that rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Darkness was not fun. And of course, at the end of the time, we're going to see a repeat of what happened in Egypt, a repeat of what happened to Ra, to Pharaoh, as the evil oppressor of God's people, because John sees the angel, right? The fifth angel, and he, he sees this. He poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People nod at their tongues in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. Sound familiar? And they, just like Pharaoh, it says, did not repent of their deeds. Pharaoh didn't repent. He didn't heed the spoken warning, nor the visible warning. He didn't listen. He ignored and he gloated. 
He ignored all the signs and the plagues. He didn't listen to Yahweh's words through Moses. And he should have because Yahweh already told him what was going to happen. Exodus 4, before any of this even began, Yahweh says this to Pharaoh. He says, Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So Pharaoh knew he had no excuse. The fact that the darkness was here now should have made him know that the threat was not empty and that judgment was close behind. And we know that's the case for after this plague of darkness that lasted three days, in the middle of the night, in the darkest part of the night, at midnight, there was a great cry in Egypt, such as there never has been nor ever will be again. Why? For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Because Yahweh made good on his promise, for he himself went through and struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Did Pharaoh know who Yahweh was now? as perhaps he cradled his firstborn in his arms and heard the wailing and the shrieks of his people. Ra, the supposed giver and protector of life, had been so easily blotted out. Pharaoh, the maintainer of Ma'at, listened as chaos reigned over his land. And he realized that he was no match for Yahweh. And the whole world was going to hear what Egypt was finding out very personally that again, Yahweh was no local Elohim or mere tribal deity. He was the God of the entire universe. And at various points it says the Hebrews looked on from afar as God's wrath poured out on that nation. But here's what's interesting, as if none of that was interesting before. This isn't the only time in history that this has happened. Do you know that? Now, the narrative points us forward. Remember the Amos passage? Here's what it said. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Well, he continues in verse 10. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. What happened in Egypt wasn't the first time, or wasn't the last time, I should say, that God brought darkness upon the land because of his displeasure. In Matthew's gospel, we read this, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, My God, why have you forsaken me? God brought darkness here once more to show his displeasure with sin. And this darkness too pointed to judgment because that's what it does. And this time it was not on the firstborn of pagan Egyptians or substitutionary lambs of the Hebrews or even the identified son of Ra, the Pharaoh, but judgment held against God's only begotten son. as he hung there on the cross in the dark. A darkness that he felt. This was no pretend son of God as Pharaoh was, just in name only. This was the son of God. And it was not for his own rebellion that wrath was poured out, but for somebody else. And then at the end of the three hours of darkness, what it's appointed to, we read this. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Darkness had preceded death. The cry that went up from Egypt that night echoed through the night, throughout all the land. But the cry that day that Jesus died echoed throughout eternity. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook 
The rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and just as the Egyptians had been plunged in the darkness for three days, the Son of God was placed in the darkness of the tomb for three days. So what does that tell us? Why do we care? Well, the question is, are you in darkness this morning that can be felt? Spiritual darkness? Perhaps you're afraid of death or something else? Is it grief? Is it the anxiety of losing a job? I went through that this week. Is it being a slave to sin that you grow up around and you can't find your way out because sin has a hold on you? Is it guilt? Is it watching your son throw bowls of blood not thinking he was going to live? Is it watching your wife battle cancer where it looks like there might not be a cure? Is it being lonely in a crowded room, do you think no one cares? Is it just rebellion that you've heard the gospel over and over and over again and you want nothing to do with it? See, the narrative of God's miraculous salvation of his people out of Egypt is the pattern of salvation of God's people today. Mankind born in the house of bondage, groping about in spiritual darkness, and then comes the deliverer. Not Moses, mind you, but the same one that they had in Egypt. Listen to what Jude writes. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, that's a sermon for another time, but he was there. But now he pours out his wrath on that sinful nation, including the death of the firstborn, which triggered the release from captivity. And this same Jesus, as God's only begotten son, has wrath poured out on him, that we might be sprung from the bondage of something far worse than slavery in Egypt, but bondage of sin and death. And so what Paul writes in Colossians can be true of us, that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And what a kingdom it is because of who the king is. Spurgeon, here you go. In life, he is my life. And in death, he shall be the death of death. In poverty, Christ is my riches. In sickness, he makes my bed. In darkness, he is my star. And in brightness, he is my sun. John says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How? Because Jesus didn't stay dead. Darkness couldn't hold him. The death that it pointed to had no sway over him. And so we go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God separated light from darkness. And at the end of time, he's going to do so again. So I implore you, don't grow up around in spiritual darkness any longer. That's where you are. For in Egypt, it ended in death, and it will soon end in a second death. Paul says we must fight this war against spiritual darkness, even today. This is not over. This, the spiritual enemies of God. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So let us not grow up anymore. For those of us who have been delivered from darkness, praise God this morning that you were blind and now you can see. I don't presume to know anybody's heart in here, but for those of you who love the darkness, 
Do you think you can keep things hidden? Live your life as you want to live it, not as God wants you to live it. Know this, that the time is short. Those of you who are suffering in the darkness, and I know a lot of you are suffering, know this, the time is short. I want us to remember the encouragement and admonition from Paul in one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For salvation, he says, is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And then he says, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your people have seen a great light, that Jesus walked this earth, that he was the light of the world, he still is the light of the world, that we may believe in him, that we may rejoice and rest in him, that we may bring people to this light. That they wouldn't grope around in spiritual darkness anymore, awaiting the punishment of death, because death has no hold over you. The price for redeeming your people in Egypt was the death of the firstborn and the substitutionary lambs. And the price for our freedom is the death of your son, the only begotten son. And it's his name that we praise and we glorify. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.